so um, why don't we turn it over to Jan and Ellie if um, you want to get started. Um, so Jan Ronis, um, I've known for a long time, a few decades maybe, we're that old, mm -hmm. we went to grad school together. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always really fun to see you, Jan, and welcome. Oh, thank thank you, you so much for um, doing this for us. And um, mm -hmm. please tell us about what's been going on with BDRC. Um, I don't want to take up too much time with with uh, introductory statements. So just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of old friends here. And um, I hope that, you know, we'll be able to catch up in person soon. But um, I make, want to make a special mention of, of uh, two of uh, BDRC's uh, directors, Andrew Quintman. Uh, Professor Quintman is the uh, the president of the board of directors, and then Lauren, who you know co-organized this event, is uh, also on the the board of directors. So thanks a lot for your your support from the from the leadership of of BDRC. Um, and then Ellie, you know, is is uh, listed on the website as technical lead, but he really is is so much more than that. That that title doesn't really encompass everything he does. I, so I just wanted to mention he's you know the the visionary behind the really complicated um, but very functional data architecture, so sophisticated. He brings a lot of you know linguistic insights to his work. Um, and he's also the head of, in, informally, partnerships and collaborations. And you'll see how um, this uh, new platform we developed was built in order to make um, really advanced collaboration partnership possible to benefit the field and also to uh, expand the the archive so i'm going to start sharing my screen i'm going to turn off my all right everyone so we are here to um talk about bdrc's new platform um and so the name of the platform is it, it goes by the acronym of buddha the buddhist digital archive but it is um you know the the product of the buddhist digital resource center it's our home base um, and so, uh, you know, we'll get into the, the relationship between the two um, soon enough, but just to clarify that. Um, oops. All right. And so, uh, you know, we should remember our founder um, at the beginning of this presentation, E. Jean Smith. He died um, almost exactly 10 years ago um, on December 16th, uh, 2010. So, you know, many of you know this uh, legend of the field, born in 1936 in Utah. Um, he, his, his contributions to Tibetan culture and Tibetan studies and Buddhism um, is really a, a play in two acts. Um, he, you know, had two major projects that have, have been so impactful. The first um, is the PL480 program to collect Tibetan texts. Uh, it's written about in uh, Curtis Schaefer's introduction to Gene's book of essays among Tibetan texts. But essentially, um, while he was uh, working with the Library of Congress in New Delhi, he was able to find a, a creative way to use uh, State Department funds to jumpstart um, an economy that would support the reprinting, publication, and widespread distribution of uh, Tibetan texts that had recently been brought over the Himalayas by Tibetan refugees and were in very precarious uh, conditions. So uh, without the scale that he was able to bring to the text preservation effort in India in the 60s and 70s, um, the tradition might have uh, many less texts in its uh, extant libraries. So we're all very grateful for him. And then uh, years later, beginning in the late 90s, um, he utilized a whole new generation of um, technology to digitally reproduce all of the texts that he helped preserve and many others. So um, we're all very grateful for Gene and, and we miss him. This is a, a lovely picture of him that Sadra, or rather Latse Foundation shared with us. Um, all right. So there's many ways to approach the new BDRC website. One would be to compare it to the legacy site. Um, so if I could just spend two or three minutes um, giving you kind of a, a fresh look at the website, which many of you have probably used um, many, many times for years, um, it I think will set the stage for what 
for some of the priorities we had when uh, developing the, the new platform. So tbrc.org, it has a slow search engine, something everyone is very patient about, but, but I wanted to point that out. It was something we wanted to overcome. Um, it gives you unranked search results, um, which, you know, people who are um, pretty knowledgeable about Tibetan studies can sort of overcome on their own. But if you are new to the field and you search for somebody like Losang Trakpa, you know, Tsongkhapa, you might be expecting that uh, his uh, person record is going to come up at the top of the list. It doesn't. Um, it's way down the list. And that's true for many other um, of the most famous individuals in Tibetan studies. It's, it's simply because the search results come back unranked. And so that can lead to a lot of um, missed connections, so to speak, uh, when searching for texts and persons. Um, then you get a lot of noisy search results. So if you see here, I, I did a search on Tusam Chuling. Um, well, it just turns out that there is no monastery called Tusam Chuling. So, you know, maybe no results should have been returned. But instead, you get things like Samten Chuling. It's, that is, you know, not a, a close match at all. Um, and so this is the kind of noise and, and uh, general set of problems that uh, our users have been so patient with um, over the years, but which, you know, we wanted to eliminate as we move to a, a much more modern um, web platform. Then the image viewer is really deficient. It was developed in 2010 and, and um, was never updated after that. Um, then there's a wonky interface. Just this weekend, I received a, um, a email from a student, a grad student at UVA who was having trouble. He said, you know, I don't know why the um, PDF download isn't working. It's only giving me the first 20 pages and the last 20 pages. Why is that? And I thought, okay, well, that's strange because the text is completely open access. That shouldn't be happening. The first 20 and last uh, 20 pages are shown only when a work is copyrighted. So, hmm, what's the problem? So I went to tbrc.org. I looked at this very familiar um, interface, which I've used so many times. And I looked at it sort of objectively and I realized, oh my gosh, there's three different download links. Of course, that's confusing. Um, so he was pressing, I, I imagine, sample PDF instead of full PDF. Well, you know, anyone can be forgiven for not knowing the, the differences between those three. So we wanted to eliminate that sort of thing um, from the new website. And we did. I'll show it to you. Um, and then uh, perhaps most fundamentally, TBRC, um, the database, not just the website, but the database itself has a very idiosyncratic data structure that's really not suitable for a multi-tradition archive or for data sharing with partner resources. And as I tried to explain, in the, um, uh, I think, three paragraph description that I wrote up for this event, um, you know, one of the impetuses behind developing our new website is that it um, was needed to accommodate BDRC's new mission. As we moved from TBRC to BDRC, we um, moved from working on Tibetan texts alone to the entirety of uh, the Buddhist literary heritage. And so we needed a, a website that could accommodate different languages and traditions. Um, so that's tbrc.org. Now, um, I just wanted, before moving on to Buddha, um, acknowledge that the new website was funded entirely by the Ho Foundation. Um, and so that's a nice kind of, you know, tendril that uh, we have here today as because this presentation is taking place at the uh, well, under the auspices of the the Ho Center at the University of Toronto. All right, so the Buddhist digital archives. Um, so this is the interface um, and you get to it at library.bdrc.io. Um, and so this is what you see sort of above the fold. But if you scroll down, there's a nice new feature, new scans released this week. Um, and it shows you thumbnails and the titles of all the newest texts that have been um, not just acquired by BDRC, but actually fully uploaded to the website. Okay, so let's go over some of the 
uh, nice new features that I think all of you um, will enjoy. The first is searched re uh, search results that come back um, in a ranked fashion. So for instance, uh, if you type in Gampopa, the first result will be the Gampopa that everybody thinks about, Gampopa Sonam Rinchen. Um, and so we were able to accomplish this ranking by developing a popularity index. Um, and so that's a, that's a nice development, something you see on, on other sites and we're now bringing it to Buddhism. But popularity is not the only way that results can be ranked. Um, it's the default, but if you want to look for closest matches or year of birth, that's now possible. You can also do it in reverse order. Um, and the ranked search results um, are also possible um, for things like texts. So you can um, search, if you search on a, on a title, um, the default will be popularity, but you can also look for closest matches or even year of publication. So that's pretty cool. Here I did, just did a sample search on Selway Melong, which is such a popular poetic title in Tibetan texts. Um, the Gyalrap Selway Melong is probably the most popular uh, text in the Tibetan canon to have that um, poetic title, and so it appears first. Um, but this also gives you all the other um, texts with that string in the title. All right, um, and then another aspect of Buddha is that um, we now um, have people search on individual facets. Um, there's several reasons for this. Uh, one is to reduce the time it takes for search results to be returned. Um, now, over the weekend, uh, some of you, some of the people in, in attendance today kindly um, sent us uh, questions and um, sort of topics and issues that you wanted addressed today. One was about um, how can I find texts on emptiness? And uh, so one way to begin this is to search on emptiness under topics. And then um, that will lead you to um, all of the texts that have been labeled as, uh, or uh, that have been marked as dealing with the topic of tombani, of emptiness. So faceted search results. Um, and when you do a faceted search result, it might seem like we are, you know, limiting you, so to speak, putting, putting your search into a silo. That's not the case at all. Um, if you look just to the left, so this was a detail, but if you look at the full screen, you'll see that to the left, every other facet that is also relevant to a particular search will show up. So Tombani, there's one topic dealing with Tombani. Okay, fine, but there's dozens of texts underneath it. But there's also many works that have Tombani in the title. Um, there's many e-texts that have it in the, in the content. And so you can easily navigate over to those lists of records without having to do a research. So the facet is not a limitation. It's not um, meant to somehow, you know, uh, prevent people from exploring the full panoply of text that we have. It's just meant to streamline things. So, so take a look um, at, at that or keep that in mind when you're doing searches. Um, now there's much less noise in the search results on Buddha. So I gave you one example earlier of, of noise. Um, now let me compare a search, uh, one on TBRC and one on uh, Buddha. So Paldin Yeshe is a uh, you know, fairly common name in, uh, in our database of persons. If you search on Buddha, Paldin Yeshe, you get everybody who has that name in, in that order. Um, Paldin Yeshe, and so there's eight people that uh, will be returned under that string. But on tbrc.org, you get the Paldin Yeshe's and then you get a bunch of other stuff. Gandin Yeshe, Tolkien Yeshe, you know, Kaldin Yeshe. Those are totally irrelevant. They should, they should not be showing up. Um, and so we've uh, eliminated those noisy searches from, uh, BDR, from Buddha's search results. Um, I think that'll also help uh, people avoid you know, tangents and um, false positives. Okay, we also have a state-of-the-art image viewer, which um, has been garnering a lot of positive results. 
Um, it gives you, you know, crisp, full color images when, when the BDRC images are themselves full color. It gives you full width viewing, scrolling vertically, um, and then you can also um, see thumbnails of every page in the text so that it's easy to uh, peruse a text. Uh, you might want to look for a break or the beginning of a new title within a volume, things like that. It's fantastic. Um, here's a, another detail. You can zoom in, you can scroll through the pages in various ways using the buttons or using your, your mouse. Um, and it also offers image, image manipulation tools in case you want to um, change the contrast or uh, highlight a particular color. You can even do a black white reverse. It's wonderful. Um, and then We've sort of solved the, the download image problem. Now there's just a single button, download images. You, you won't um, be confused by it. E-texts. So uh, tbrc.org did have a number of e-texts. And um, I, for one, you know, benefited greatly from the full text searching within e-text that was possible on tbrc.org. I used to teach um, classical Tibetan and uh, the full text, the e-text search on tbrc.org um, was my best friend when I was looking for uh, examples, real, real world examples of particular terms or grammatical particles and so forth. It was fantastic, but we were um, you know, repeatedly asked for the ability to download entire e-text or even just to read entire e-text on the site. That wasn't possible in tbrc.org. It is now on Buddha. Um, and not only do we uh, you know, make it possible for e-text to be downloaded or read, but um, we can also align images with the corresponding e-text. And that's because of a partnership that we have with Google, a really fruitful partnership that um, uh, has allowed us to run a majority of our of the Tibetan texts in our archive through Google's very accurate OCR engine. Some other features of uh, e-texts um, are that uh, well, you you can here's the faceted search on e-text. So uh, if you type in something like you know Perky Rabjung Chuni, then you see a, a bunch of results, including a little bit of context. Um, so this is. Uh, what you'll see when you when you first get the results, but then if you there's many other options here. You can expand on the context to see you know three full pages from the e-text, or you just press open an e-text. Um, and then furthermore, when there is more than one occurrence of your query in a given e-text, you can see all of them at once by clicking on other matches. So, and here we see now. On, on one simple screen without a lot of extra noise, the three things you're looking for so that you would know exactly where to, to go in the text. Click on the, um, the hit that's most relevant to you and you know, off you go with your research. So um, the e-text uh, component to Buddha is, um, is really advanced and, and I know that all of you will, will make great use of it. So that's what I wanted to say for now about uh, Buddha's uh, sort of basic features. Uh, we'll do some some live test drives later on, uh, based on note, based on the queries that, that some of you um, suggested to us in advance, and also based on, on questions you have during the, the Q and A period. But before we um, go any further on the practicalities of using Buddha, I think it's um, important now for all of us to understand it's advanced uh, data architecture. And, and this is largely the brainchild of LE as, uh, as informed by you know, the, the newest standards in, in library science. And so let me stop sharing my screen and hand it over to him. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Here it is. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to present uh, the architecture of Buddha and also 
the new data and uh, some of the new um, features of the, the model that um, are important to navigate the new website. So uh, first, in terms of um, technology, the um, new uh, website is based on linked open data or semantic web. Um, it's, uh, so instead of our old uh, idiosyncratic uh, data model, we now have um, developed a data model that we hope we can uh, share and that uh, other projects can use. And uh, through um, you know, a shared data model and data format, we can exchange uh, data uh, much more easily. And uh, so the, um, the consequence of that is that we can, uh, when you search on Buddha, uh, you actually search on multiple data sets. So we have partnerships with uh, other institutions and um, what we implemented is what's called a federated search. So every time you search on Buddha, you actually search on multiple um, databases. Um, yeah, so that's for the, the data itself, not for the, the images. We are using um, a protocol called IIIF. Uh, it allows us to do two things. Uh, one is to um, present images on our website uh, that are hosted by partner institutions. And also it allows anyone to embed our images on their website. And uh, so it's um, a very uh, important standard that's used now by museums, libraries, uh, art galleries, etc. So it really al allows us uh, a lot of partnerships uh, that are now made very easy by migrating to this uh, technology. So the way it looks like uh, in one direction, so here's a screenshot of the Zongsa Kim Seishu Institute website. And uh, so what they have is, um, so this part of the website is the um, actually the Buddha image, image viewer. And uh, so they, they created this uh, collection of texts for their Shedra. So it's organized by year. And um, so they have this uh, outline view and then they can view the images uh, from the website directly on, uh, on their website for their students. So that's uh, one direction. And another uh, is, uh, that we have partnerships with, for instance, the um, British Library, and we display their images uh, on our website. So I'm going to to give an example of that. But um, so um, yeah, basically, we don't have a copy of the images, but they appear uh, seamlessly on Buddha as if they were BDRC images. We just uh, have. Um, uh, British Library logo, so that it's clear that uh, they're not from us. But uh, anyway, so the, um, we imported uh, different collections from the British Library and also other that I'm going to detail in the next slide. But from the British Library, we have quite a lot. We have one Sanskrit collection of 235 manuscripts, uh, four Bhutanese collections of uh, 2,500 volumes, and uh, some Tibetan texts uh, from Amdo, it's uh, 1,200 texts. Um, so yeah, just to show you what it looks like. So w when you run Buddha, so I'm going to demonstrate after that the, um, how you can reach uh, you know, this page. But um, basically when you run Buddha, you will see uh, this uh, image viewer. And so these images that you are seeing are hosted by the British Library. So we had uh, this logo here. And then you can scroll through the images uh, as if they were uh, from BDRC, basically. So um, this is quite convenient. And we have uh, partnerships with other institutions as well. Uh, so we have some uh, texts from the Cambridge University Digital Library, 185 uh, quite rare Sanskrit manuscripts. Uh, from Internet Archive, we have 32 scans from the Hodgson collection, so which are Sanskrit texts from Nepal. Uh, we have 300 scans from the Waddell collection at the Stadtbibliothek zu Berlin. Uh, 1,500 scans from the Van Manen collection uh, from Leiden. And um, we hope to have uh, in the near future some scans also from the International Dunhuang project. So all these scans are uh, accessible, like when you search a title, 
and it's you have a match in this collection, then you can stay on Buddha and uh, you know, just view the images, etc., as if uh, they were uh, from BDRC. Um, so this type of partnership is quite important. And we also have another type of partnership which uh, doesn't involve images, but only involves the, the catalogs. Uh, the by far largest uh, catalog import that we had is the NGMPP catalog. So it's from the Nepalese German Manuscript Preservation Project, uh, where they, they photographed uh, 30,000 uh, texts, uh, Tibetan texts on microfilms, plus about 40,000 um, Sanskrit and Newari Buddhist texts, uh, also on microfilms. So we, although we have a few scans, like we have about 300 scans, uh, we, we have imported the whole Tibetan catalog and uh, so this creates uh, more uh, results. And so when there's a, a text that you uh, search and it's not on BDRC, at least you know uh, that it's available in this collection, even though we don't have the images. So for uh, this type of partnerships, we have um, a few partners, like one is the Gretil, so it's the um, uh, Sanskrit uh, e-texts. Uh, we have about 620 links that are discoverable on Buddha. Um, Treasury of Lives, uh, we have links to their uh, collection, the 84,000 Wikidata. Uh, Sakya Research Center is, um, provides quite a lot of new data because they have um, person records and place records uh, about uh, persons and places that we don't have in our database. So you can uh, find some matches in their database. Um, we also imported Marcus Bingenheimer's uh, bibliography of uh, translations from the Chinese Buddhist canon into Western languages. Um, and um, also we have some links to VIF and WorldCat. So as this is quite um, uh, new, I'm just going to present uh, quickly what it, so, uh, what it is, because you may not be interested in clicking on that, but uh, it actually is quite uh, important. So this is the person record for Shantideva. And if you click on uh, open resource in WorldCat, what you're going to see is the, um, all the texts by Shantideva that has been um, cataloged by the, by the biggest libraries in the world. And so most of them are the um, translations in Western language of the um, of different works that he wrote. So when you want to see, you know, uh, what translations are available of some of these texts, uh, then you can click on that, and you have uh, you know this nice list of uh, translations in a lot of different languages. Um, Okay, we also have um, some new data uh, from the um, Chinese canon. So we have uh, imported two different things. One is the um, DILA person authority database, which represents about 40,000 uh, person records. So when you search in Chinese on Buddha, you can find hits uh, in this database. And we also imported the, um, the outline of the Taisho Tripitaka. Um, and uh, for each um, for each text uh, in the Taisho, we have links uh, to C Beta and SAT. Um, plus, we have a partnership with SAT where they provide us the their images in IIIF. So you can see the images uh, from the Chinese Buddhist canon um, from the SAT images. So yeah, so basically when you are uh, on the Buddhist canon, on the Chinese canon, uh, you can browse this outline. And um, so for each text, uh, you see you have links here to C beta and SAT. Uh, and you can see, uh, and you can read the scans uh, from uh, SAT. So sometimes they're a little bit slow. Um, yeah, this display is a bit, yeah, anyways, we'll look at that later. And something uh, quite important is that for each canonical text, uh, both, uh, I mean, from the Tibet and the Chinese, Tibetan and Chinese canon, uh, we have indicated the parallels uh, with the, between the Tibetan, Sanskrit, and Chinese. So when you are uh, on a um, 
on a Tibetan canonical text, uh, you can see the parallels in the in the Chinese canon and also in the Indic word, uh, so it works uh, when we have them. So one such example would be uh, Oh, oh yeah. by the way, now you can um, search uh, in, um, in Sanskrit or Pali uh, without the diacritics. And uh, if you select Indic, you will find results. Uh, oops, that's should be an A, no. Well, I think you searched on English. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's better. Uh, so here uh, you can see that uh, there are matches uh, uh, with the diacritics. And um, by the way, you can see here that, uh, you know, this is a Sadamar Pundarika from the British Library. This one is from the Cambridge University Library, etc. But so if you go on the, um, on this and you go on the, on the work, uh, you can see, uh, the different the parallels in the different languages. So here, uh, this Indic text has a, a parallel in the in this Tibetan text, and it has three uh, parallels in the in the Chinese canon. And so, if you click on one of these uh, on this parallel, for instance, uh, you can see the um, translations in uh, Western languages that come from the from Marcus Mingenheimer's uh, bibliography. And you can see the origin of the, the information um, when you, you know, when you put your mouse uh, somewhere. There's a little pop-up that says where it comes from. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, that's quite an important uh, import that we created and that uh, we hope uh, will be the start of uh, more uh, partnerships in the Eastern, East Asian studies. And uh, finally, before I make a, a more uh, I don't know, concrete demo, I just want to introduce the new model that we're using because it's quite important to have it in mind when you browse the new website as it's quite different from tbrc.org. So it just concerns the bibliographical parts, not like the persons, places, etc. They don't really change. But for the, um, the works, I mean, for the bibliographical part, we now have one entity type that's called work. And the, the main attributes of the work will be uh, author or topic, language, etc. And then we have a different uh, type of entity uh, that we call version. And the typical um, properties of this entity will be like the publisher, uh, the scribe, the printery, etc. And uh, there can be uh, several versions uh, for one work. So this means like if we go back to this example that I took, where it is, uh, where is it? Yeah. If you go to the Sadrama Pundarika work, uh, you can see that we have uh, all these different versions. And there are different manuscripts or different prints, et cetera. So that's uh, very important. And also we have uh, two new types of uh, entities. One is the scans. So scans is actually, um, uh, you could say a subtype of a version, but it has some specific properties such as scan info, you know, where we got the scans, uh, who provided them, when the scans were made, etc. So that's the typical kind of properties that you will find there. And we also have um, this new type called uh, e-texts. Uh, so, I mean, it's not really a new type, but it's uh, conceptualized in a different way from tbrc.org. And so an e-text uh, version, if you want, uh, will have some properties such as, you know, who created the e-text and how, is it an OCR, is it a manual input, uh, et cetera. And finally, there is uh, one entity that uh, didn't exist at all on tbrc.org. It, so it's the item, so it's like the physical, uh, the properties of the physical thing, uh, like in which library is it, uh, you know, or which museum or uh, which monastery, et cetera. And uh, maybe it can have, have also a shelf mark in the library, etc. So I'm just going to show what it looks like um, on the website. Uh, so, oops. 
so if you search uh, the biography of Milarepa, for instance, uh, here you will find, uh, all, so by default, what you're searching is uh, in the versions. Uh, so here you can see the new search results, uh, which have uh, these uh, nice uh, thumbnails. And so, um, if you click on this result, for instance, you will go in this display, which has you know, three tabs, one for the work, version, and scan. And um, here, for instance, if you go to the work, you will see all the, the other versions of this particular work that we have. And you can see like the properties will be like the language, so it's in Tibetan, the, the creator, the, like the main author is uh, Peggy Chen. There's a, a short summary in English, the topic, the genre, etc. And for the version, you have uh, a little thumbnail and you have uh, the different titles that are indicated uh, on the physical object. Um, you have the publication date, your publication name, location, the etc. I mean, you can see for and for the the scans, uh, you can see you know this thing that we used to have on tbrc.org, but it's not it wasn't displayed on the website. But now you can see the origin of the scans. So it was scanned in 2014, apparently in uh, in Cambridge. So so yeah, that's um, a demo for the bibliographical model. And um, so in conclusion, so Buddha is still a work in progress. We still have, are quite uh, focused on the development, but it's, I mean, we uh, certainly hope it's uh, usable and uh, we encourage you to, to use it and give us some feedback. And the future priorities will be uh, the annotations of records and new, generally more user engagement. Uh, so that you can, uh, you know, comment on a record or uh, request a, a change or indicate like maybe there's a typo somewhere or add some notes, etc. And um, also in another level, which would be uh, that we have sometimes some duplicates um, in the, I don't know, we have two records for the same person or for the same place, the same work, etc. And so we want to uh, have some sort of crowdsourcing uh, for that to allow users to uh, send some feedback uh, on that. Uh, we also want to implement the search on multiple terms, uh, which is something that we got in the, the feedback uh, to prepare this, uh, this demo. So basically what it will probably be like is that you will have a sort of plus button here and you can you know, add one term here and another term, etc. You can add as many terms as you want. Um, and um, something that we will start to work on ne uh, early next year will be to improve our Burmese catalog and um, have a search engine that works well for the Burmese language. So yeah, don't hesitate to send off some uh, feedback, uh, if possible negative, so that we can fix uh, the problems. But you know, positive feedback is good too. So yeah, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. So I don't know if we should make a demo or, I mean. Well, yeah. So um, since we have 10 minutes before the end of this segment, um, I was thinking to do some, some live demos based on um, queries and issues that were shared with us before the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, great, okay, so let's do that. Um, all right, then maybe I'll, I'll share my screen yeah. again. Thank you, Ellie, for that. Wow, um, I hope you, you know, were able to uh, appreciate the, uh, you know, the sophistication of the, the new website and um, how it's, you know, already been able to integrate at a, at a very sophisticated and deep way, you know, numerous different data sets and, um, and how much potential there is um, for for BDRC and, and for the field um, moving forward as more and more um, institutions and, and partners start to um, use the, this shared um, shared model. Um, and so let me share my screen to show a couple of uh, 
searches. All right. Um, so go back to here. Share. All right. So um, people asked some interesting questions about, um, you know, uh, searching on places, searching on people, and so forth. And um, so let me um, kind of walk you through a, a few of them. And um, I'll just point out at the beginning that some of the ways in which uh, this can be used um, have to do with, you know, understanding how to use the new search interface. Um, but then other ways to profitably, profitably use BDRC have to do with more kind of qualitative ways of figuring out how to um, refine your, your searches. Um, and so I'll try to show how, how these two things kind of work in tandem. Um, so in other words, sometimes you have to just, you know, get better at, at using the um, protocols. And then at other times you need to learn how to, you know, modify your searches to try to um, bring back other results that didn't come up the first time around, but are still relevant. Um, so someone's asked about this place um, in Omdo. So we'll search on Gangsa under places, Tibetan Wiley. All right. And uh, so you'll see that the top record is for the um, county. So that should be, you know, relatively um, pertinent here. Um, and then there's a number of, of monasteries that have, that are in Kangsa. But let's go to the main record here for at least the modern county. And so you get the Chinese, the Pinyin, um, and, and take a look at our um, logos. We put a lot of work into our new logos. This one is kind of cute. You know, it plays on the, the pin that you find in so many maps, but then it um, adds some, some Buddhist and Tibetan visual elements to it. Um, so the variant labels, the different ways in which this uh, place is, um, is named. What is it? It's a county. Where is it located? So what is it located within? And then what does it contain? And it contains all of these different um, monasteries and villages. Um, so that's good. And then down at the bottom of, of the screen, you find related resources. And so this will have works about Kansa. So these would be texts that deal with Kansa and have been labeled by our librarians as such. Um, and so for instance, here's the, you know, the Kansa Logu. So of course that's gonna be relevant. Um, that's why it comes up first. But click on all and then you get to see all of the associated records other places, and so these would be largely the, the places that are contained within Kangsa. But then there's those two works that deal with it. And then there's even a person who was born there. And so is labeled. And this would be, I think, the, the great author, Falmo. Um, and so again, this is a, a way to navigate through, um, through the records. You can see how, um, with Buddha, none of the data from TBRC has been lost. Um, it's just been um, organized in, in new ways. So that's Kangsa. Then, uh, so yeah, what I wanted to point out there was um, how you can, uh, you know, from one search get uh, into um, the records from, from different aspects of the, the database um, and therefore uh, pretty much span everything that we have about that place. Then um, someone asked about Gyalrong. And so let me search on that. So this is um, Gyalrong in uh, far Eastern Tibet. Let's search under places. Um, we started with Kangsa because that's a named modern county. So it's it's quite well documented. Whereas Gyalrong, it's a, you know it's a traditional designation. Um, if you look on a modern map, there's no one place called for, called Gyalrong. So 
um, searching for things about Gaurang require a little bit more uh, finesse in your searches. But um, because it is such an important cultural area of Tibet, of course, there is a place um, record for it in the database. So here we search on Gaurang. Great. And we see that, you know, there's lots of resources and so forth. But what I want to point out is that it has these alternate names, Gyalmo Tsawarong, and also just Tsawarong. So if you search on Gyalrong, you know, you will find, uh, you know, a lot of hits, but then always look for the variant labels and search on those as well. So it's labeled as a canyon. I don't think <laughs> that's exactly right. We can fix that. Uh, more of a deep valley um, or system of valleys. Can, it has, tells you everything that's contained within it and then works about Gyalrong um, and so forth. So that's about the same. But then what we can do here is go back to the search results and then let's search for Gaurong on e-texts. So um, we now have 4,000 new full, full text e-texts in the database. Um, and so right now when you search on places, it doesn't call up um, instances of your search within e-text. So you'll always have to search on those independently. Don't forget, of, of course you, it will, um, well, hopefully it will return a lot of relevant results as it does here. So 330 results of Gyalrong. Um, and you see the results in context, that's wonderful. And then you think, okay, there's Gyalrong, that's great, but you know, let me try Gyalmo Tsawarong because um, maybe the really, you know, illuminating mention of this place is going to be, is going to occur in a text that, that names it as, as Gyalmo Tsawarong. So again, I, I just wanted to point out some of the sort of hacks that you need to do to get the most out of the database. We can't, um, it would just take too much time for us to go in and, and um, pre-search on Gyalmo Tsawarong is equal to Gyalmo, uh, Gyalrong and so forth. You know, that, that's something that maybe we'll have to wait for AI to do. But in the meantime, always search on these, on these variants. Um, I know that the power users in the audience uh, don't need to be told that, but sometimes um, graduate students um, need, that, need that kind of advice. So those were two searches. Um, another, uh, someone asked how to search within colophons. And um, we don't offer uh, colophons as a, um, as a facet because it's not necessary. When you search within versions, it searches um, within the uh, colophons if we have transcribed them. We don't transcribe all colophons, um, but we, we often do, especially for the important texts. And so uh, if you are searching on, on something and it appears in a colophon, it will come up. So let's see if here, here's an example. All right, so we have the Tercha of, of Sasum Lingba, and this is a transcribed colophon. Gyalmo Tsawarong shows up, and so you get it. Um, so again, searching on colophons, um, you're doing it even though you might not know it. Let's go to the actual record. Oh, where does it appear? So which text was it? Um, or is it this one? Let's see more. Well, at any rate, that's, um, that's how it works. Um, all right, and then another question. Um, so someone said, I'm going to finish a chapter on um, Torgut Kalmuk monks traveling between early modern Tibet and Russia. I use the keywords. Um, and so, but I wonder if there are more records in the database on this, uh, the new database. So everything that, that was part of the TBRC database is now on BDRC. Um, nothing was, was left out. At, but the BDRC database is um, much more uh, expansive, in part because we now um, are federating our searches out to a number of different really important institutions, the British Library, Internet Archive, Cambridge, um, NGMPP, and so forth. 
but then the e-texts also um, the 4,000 new e-texts um, are also, you know, uh, adding significantly to the, the database and therefore to the um, informative results that you'll get back. So um, while, you know, Russia and Mongolia are not, are not my specialties, I would invite the person who asked for that to um, not only search on, on say, uh, Urusu as a, as a topic and a place, but also search under e-text for that, and hopefully you'll get uh, a lot more results. Another person asked about um, how they can find Mo Mongolian monks who studied at Drepung. This is um, the kind of thing that at present, you know, we're not able to document um, in the database. So um, we, we don't often, um, well, we simply don't uh, label people's ethnicities or places of origin. We do have their birthplace, um, but we don't, you know, you can't search on, say, a Mongolian person who happened to study in Drepung. And even studying in Drepung is a little bit um, complicated. But um, through various hacks, you can get at this. Um, so we have thousands of person records, not all of the the persons we have in the database are authors, which is fantastic. Sometimes if there's a famous Lama, we'll go through their, their biography and then create records for all of their students, even if uh, some of these students you know, never wrote texts, uh, at least texts that we have in the database. So what I would say to that person is, um, do searches on all the famous Mongolian Lamas and Geshes who studied it at Drepung, uh, go to their person records and look at um, at the students that are um, associated with them. And that might um, help you find people that you didn't yet know about. And then you'll have to maybe search on, on e-text or um, other resources entirely to help with that. I know that uh, Treasury of Lives is now expanding into um, Mongolia and, and more deeply into Inner Asia. Um, every time they come up with, with uh, person records that we don't have, we, we integrate them into the database. So slowly we'll, we'll have that. But there's some types of very sort of organic searches that, that just um, we don't have the time to model. And that would be something like, I want to know all Mongolians who happen to study at Drepung and not other monasteries. Um, so there's, there are just are some limits, but because of the um, comprehensiveness of the data and now with all of the full texts that we have um, with some, you know, interesting searches. Uh, I hope that you'll, you'll find uh, at least some of, of what you're looking for. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at that because it's, it's after the, the top of the hour now. Uh, perhaps we can move on to uh, a Q&A session. Yeah. Wow, great. Uh, thank you so much, Jan and Ellie. That's just so amazing. I'm really, um, uh, as you can tell, like I'm lacking words to describe how exciting this is, <laughs> these changes and how much this is going to uh, revolutionize the field. I, I'm just uh, so impressed. So um, in the remaining time, we want to take some questions from our participants here. So if anyone has a question for Jan or Ellie, please um, speak up, raise your hand or unmute yourself and speak. I think we'll you can up. unmute yourselves. We'll turn off the recording now, is that right, Francis? Sure, yeah. Okay.